Okay, good morning and welcome to today's discussion about quantum computing in Canada and Germany as part of Berlin Science Week. This event is one of 50 events celebrating 50 years of Canadian-Germany cooperation in science and technology. My name is Peter Mason, director of the newly launched Quantum Sensors Challenge Program at the National Research Council of Canada, and I'll be your master of ceremonies today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the National Research Council occupies many of the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis peoples, and Inuit, whose ancestral footsteps and rights extend beyond the colonial boundaries that exist today. We respectfully honor these people's rights, history, and relationships with this land. We will open today with some words from Canada's ambassador to Germany, Stefan Dion. The Honorable Stefan Dion is the ambassador to Germany and special envoy to the European Union in Europe. He presented his credentials as Canada's ambassador to Germany in 2017. Monsieur Dion was Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he championed Canada's leadership in the world on crucial global interests, including promotion of universal human rights, peace and stability efforts, the global climate challenge, and Canada's commitment to multiculturalism and multilateralism. Previously, he was Minister of the Environment, Minister Responsible for Official Languages, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and also chaired the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. Monsieur Dion. Sir Gerter Herr Menel, Cher Dr. Tanguay, Ladies and gentlemen, by the Damen und Herren, chers amis du Canada. Are we on the eve of a new quantum revolution? It appears to be the case with promises of a radically different future from the world, for the, from the world we know today. The quantum properties of materials open up countless new opportunities in areas as varied as manufacturing, healthcare, the environment, mobility, communications, transportation, navigation, defense, and cybersecurity. There is virtually no limit to people's creativity when it comes to new applications of quantum technologies capable of solving problems of process optimization and simulation out of reach for conventional computer. But for this revolution to come true, these two leading high-tech leaders that are Germany and Canada must strengthen their partnership. And so, thank you all of you for joining this exciting session of the Berlin Science Week titled Canada-Germany Quantum Computing. I'm always thrilled to join Berlin Science Week, which brings together the world's most innovative scientific organizations to celebrate and promote science. But this year, I am especially thrilled, given the immense potential of our cooperation in quantum technology. And it's great that we have chosen this crucial topic, quantum technology, precisely as we celebrate this year, the 50th anniversary of the agreement on science and technology between Canada and Germany. For 50 years, our countries have supported more than a thousand collaborative scientific projects, which have spanned the spectrum of research to bring together our government, research institutes, universities, nonprofit organizations, and businesses. Today's event will shed light on the tremendous opportunities to be found in quantum computing. Canada, which ranks first in per capita spending of overall in quantum computing research, Canada has recently launched a $360 million national quantum strategy, which will build on previous investments by bolstering support for this burgeoning sector. Canada will be a great partner for Germany in what is projected to become a world dollar industry over the next three decades. And as I pass the floor to our recent selection of speakers and panelists, I want to thank all of you for your participation and please, please keep up the inspiring and important work. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank. Merci du fond du cœur. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Dion. We now welcome remarks from Dr. Geneviève Tanguay, Vice President of the National Research Council. In 2016, Dr. Geneviève Tanguay joined the National Research Council of Canada as the first woman Vice President of Research. 
She leads the Emerging Technologies Division, which oversees nanotechnology, metrology, astronomy and astrophysics, security and disruptive technologies, and advanced electronics and photonics. Dr. Tange also serves as the Canadian co-chair of the Canada-Germany Joint Science and Technology Cooperation Committee. Prior to joining the National Research Council, she served as Vice Rector of Research, Creativity and Innovation at the University of Montreal, and also served as the Assistant Deputy Minister responsible for research, innovation, science, and society in the government of Quebec. Dr. Tange. Good morning and good afternoon, Ambassador Dion, Herr Menel, honored guests and colleagues. Guten Tag, danke schön. I'm honored to be here with you today and be part of opening this remarkable event that is an exciting feature of the Berlin Science Week. First off, First I would off, like I to thank the organizers of this event, the Embassy of Canada in Berlin and NRC Germany in Munich. The science, technology and innovation relationship between Canada and Germany runs deep. We have been collaborating with German researchers and scientists for several decades, and I'm thrilled to say that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of signing the Canada-Germany Treaty for Scientific and Technological Cooperation this year. To strengthen our remarkable relationship, the NRC laid roots in Germany in December 2019 by establishing a post at the Canadian Consulate in Munich led by Dr. Jennifer Decker. We are eager to deepen our s and partnerships with Germany, including in the area of quantum technologies. Currently, we have a number of collaborative projects in quantum sensing, which you will hear more about later in today's agenda. Worldwide, countries and governments are recognizing the power of quantum technologies. Quantum promises to be among the next enabling and foundational technological platforms spanning multiple applications in all industries, including healthcare, energy, finance, telecom, and more. Quantum computing holds the potential to solve complex problems exponentially more quickly than existing computers. In some cases, quantum computers are able to efficiently solve problems that are completely intractable on classical computers. They can help solve some complex math and simulations necessary to advance engineering and other areas of science. As quantum computing technologies continue to rapidly progress, the need to enhance cybersecurity and build quantum safe systems to secure infrastructures and economies will also be increasingly critical. I hope that the insight generated from today's event will spark ongoing interaction between our two nations on the possibilities that quantum computing technologies hold for our respective societies. We are so pleased to be part of this event, and I'm sure we will continue growing our engagement efforts with Germany in quantum computing and beyond. Events like this one are critical to help us understand the challenges our nations are dealing with and to help advance standardized practical quantum computing for widespread applications. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to hearing about the fantastic outcomes from the Berlin Science Week. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Tangue. Uh, next up is Mr. Fritjof Menel, who is the Deputy Director General for International Cooperation in Education and Research, German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, also known as BMBF. In 1992, he joined the Federal Ministry for Research and Technology, today's Federal Ministry of Education and Research, where he held various positions. He worked in the Internal Market and Information Society Directorates General at the European Commission in Brussels. Mr. Menel was appointed head of the Strategy Division at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in 2007. Later on, he was appointed head of the Directorate for International Cooperation at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Mr. Menel. Yeah, from the Canadian and German Science and Innovation Community. I'm honored to welcome you on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research to this event on quantum computing at the Berlin Science Week. As my colleague Tonge from the National Research Council of Canada already pointed out, this event is part of the 50th anniversary of our science and technology agreement that has been signed in 1971. A jubilee we as BMBF are very proud of. 
there are very few countries in this world where we have such a long-lasting and formalized collaboration in science than with Canada. The quality and liveliness of our collaboration with Canada is outstanding and covers nearly all areas and all disciplines of scientific research. At that time in the early 70s, when the contract was signed, probably no one of the high-level representatives of both countries had an idea what quantum technology or quantum computing might be. No one has probably anticipated that it will be one of the most thrilling research areas science has to offer in the third decade of this century. That demonstrates at least two things. First, in science and innovation, it's difficult to predict the future, and elsewhere, of course. Secondly, one of the many strengths of the mutually beneficial collaboration between our two countries is our ability to adapt quickly to new trends, priorities, and research areas that have the potential for new insights or new technological pathways. With no doubt, the full potential of quantum technologies is not yet fully unfolded and quantum, like artificial intelligence, has the potential to be a game changer for science as well as for our economies. To foster the development and use of quantum technologies, the German government is combining forces to cover the whole value chain from basic research to market access for quantum technologies. In our recent framework program and for the coming years, there are approximately 3 billion euros earmarked for the support of quantum technologies covering e.g. computing system and use case development, a communication pilot network and lighthouse projects and sensing and metrology. From these initiatives, we will build a strong ecosystem with academia and industry. International collaboration is an inherent element of our national research strategies and Canada is of course one of the leading nations in quantum computing today. In the last two to three years we had several joint funding activities with Canada in areas like added value manufacturing, AI and hydrogen research, just to name a few. And I'm convinced that the excellent scientists on both sides of the Atlantic are not running short of ideas for new collaborations. I'm wishing all of you for this event a lot of new insights on the quantum ecosystems of both countries and interesting discussions with your colleagues. Finally, I'd like to thank the NRC and the Canadian Embassy for organizing the event and inviting us to be a partner. Thank you, Mr. Menel. We will now have our first lecture of the program, which will be a, a technology overview of quantum computing given by Dr. Phil Kay. Dr. Kay is the program director of the National Research Council's Applied Quantum Computing Challenge Program. He served in a variety of roles within the Government of Canada's Communication Security Establishment, primarily as a trusted advisor on the impacts of quantum technologies. He also worked for the Canadian quantum computing company D-Wave Systems as program director of corporate affairs. Phil co-founded and chaired Quantum Industry Canada, a consortium representing over 24 Canadian quantum technology companies. Presently, Phil is serving as the program director of the National Research Council's new Applied Quantum Computing Challenge Program, where I have had the privilege of working with him over the last year and a half. Phil, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so this will be a quick technology overview, just to sort of set the table for um, the, uh, the following uh, rest of the Morning. Uh, so next slide, please. So early in the 20th century, as physicists uh, explored nature and, and probed nature at uh, scales of, uh, you know, increasingly small scales, uh, they started to realize that, that nature behaved in ways that were very, very remarkably different than, um, than we were accustomed to. Uh, and in fact, ways that are very counter to intuition and sort of our common sense view of, of how the world behaves. And so the story here is that quantum physics is uh, very, very different from classical physics. It's, it's not simply about changing some parameters in your equations. It's about uh, a whole new paradigm for, uh, for how nature behaves. 
And so that's, it's very important to realize that when you're thinking about quantum technologies. Next slide, please. So uh, physics and, and the natural sciences are, of course, are about understanding how, understanding and predicting how nature behaves uh, and, and um, you know, and, and, and modeling that. Um, and as our, our understanding of, of, um, of nature develops, we then turn that, that understanding into technology, which is about harnessing and controlling the behavior of nature to do useful things. And so in the 1930s, of course, um, quantum physics began uh, Replace, well, not replacing, but superseding classical physics as our understanding of how nature behaves at a microscopic scale. And more recently, in the last two to three decades, we've been turning that understanding into an ability to manipulate the physical world at a quantum mechanical level and to um, harness some of these some of these very different behaviors to do uh, useful tasks in ways that are very, very different uh, and cannot be done classically. Broadly speaking, you can classify quantum technologies in, into three sort of categories, uh, much as we do with classical technologies. There are computing technologies, quantum computing technologies, there are quantum communications technologies, and there, of course, there are quantum sensing technologies. Next slide, please. So quantum computing uh, is, of course, about um, solving, prob solving information theoretic problems using a computer. Uh, and what a quantum computer is, uh, as um, Dr. Tange uh, explained, a quantum computer is about harnessing quantum mechanics to do com computations in fundamentally new ways, which for certain classes of problems are able to outperform uh, the best known uh, classical computing approaches. Communications, of course, is about using, uh, using some of the features of quantum mechanics to perform certain communications tasks uh, that, that are impossible classically. Uh, or in ways that are more efficient than you can do classically. Uh, and one of those tasks is about secure communications. Quantum mechanics allows, uh, provides a new set of tools for communicating securely uh, that provide some capabilities that we don't have access to with classical technology. And finally, quantum sensors. Um, in fact, I probably should have put quantum sensors at the top of the list because in some sense, quantum sensors are the closest to having a, you know, a real world commercial impact. Um, the idea of a quantum sensor is Roughly speaking, a quantum system, quantum, a quantum mechanical system is very, very sensitive to its environment. And for building quantum computers, for example, that can be a, a significant challenge um, because for, you know, to, to protect the system's properties and the system and the quantum system's behavior, we have to shield it from its environment very carefully while still controlling it. But you can turn a, that around, of course, if a system is so sensitive to its environment, why not use it to sense the environment? And that is exactly what quantum sensors are about. And quantum sensors can um, be developed that can sense a variety of signals, uh, including gravitational signals, electromagnetic signals, light, uh, in, and, and can do so um, with a sensitivity that goes beyond a fundamental limit that classical sensors face called the, the, the quantum limit or the classical limit. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, quantum computers. Uh, <clears throat> so as with any computing technology, you've got hardware and you've got software. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware. Uh, this is. It's still early days, really, for, for quantum computers. Um, you know, the, the quantum computers are, are still um, um, mass. Well, they, they may always be, but they're still, you know, room size um, systems. Uh, and, and in fact, it's still not clear uh, which what type of physical technology is going to win the day uh, going forward for, for realizing what we call scalable fault tolerant quantum computers of the future. Uh, the current uh, quantum computers that we have uh, are being explored with a variety of technologies. Superconducting qubits that uh, are cooled down to extremely low temperatures are some of the more common, uh, commonly explored technologies for implementing quantum computers. Uh, another approach is to trap uh, is ion traps, and Honeywell, uh, for example, is, is uh, building machines uh, of that type. Uh, this, the current state-of-the-art systems we call noisy intermediate scale quantum, or NISQ, NISC, and they've got you know right now about 100 qubits um, and for the next few years we're probably going to be in the hundreds of qubits um, depending on of course on on um, on, on how fast the uh, the uh, people are able to uh, to scale these things but scaling them is a huge challenge um, but they are getting to an interesting state where now the, the NISC quantum computers that are appearing are actually of a size and complexity beyond which we can simulate classically meaning their behavior is now um, offering the potential for truly novel capabilities. Uh, when we get, when we want to get to truly um, large-scale quantum computers that can run some of the 
the, the really transformative uh, applications that, that, um, that we know about, we're going to require uh, what we call fault tolerance, which is basically error correction. Um, and the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is that quantum computers, um, more so than classical computers, are very, very susceptible to noise and errors. And uh, there's a huge overhead that's required to, um, to redundantly encode uh, information in a quantum computer to correct for those errors and to stay ahead of them. Uh, and to, um, so to achieve fault tolerance, we're likely going to need to scale up from where we are now with NISC to systems that have millions of physical quantum bits. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, next slide. We'll skip this one. A bit short on time. Um, so software. Um, the other side of quantum computing, of course, is software. So one thing to understand is a quantum computer is not just a souped up computer that runs your, your Python program uber fast. A quantum computer is a, is a new type of system that, um, that operates in ways that are, that are qualitatively different than a, than a classical computer. And a quantum algorithm uh, is sort of a, a program that runs on a quantum computer is something that you can't run on a classical computer because the way even the very nature of uh, the information contained within a quantum computer is fundamentally different. Uh, in, in a classical computer, your information is, is a digital. It's in bits, binary digits, ones and zeros. In a quantum computer, you have what are called quantum bits, where uh, you can have uh, arbitrary superpositions. A quantum bit can be a one or a zero or some superposition of one and zero. Uh, and that is a, a very important um, difference. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things about a quantum algorithm is that um, it's very, very tricky to... Um, to design a quantum algorithm that can outperform the best classical algorithms for a problem because they really have to exploit the structure of the problem they're solving uh, very specifically. And one of the ways of thinking about how a quantum computer can achieve a computational advantage is to sort of explore multiple computation paths in parallel in superposition, uh, and then to use what's called interference to, uh, to have sort of the, the, the answers that don't line up with the correct answer that you're looking for sort of cancel each other out and the, and the uh, computational paths that result in the, in the correct answers sort of uh, reinforce each other. And you can see that, I mean, that's very tricky to arrange. Um, you have to really understand the problem you're solving. And so the point I want to make here is that quantum algorithms research is really, really hard. Um, and and um, there's a lot of work still to be done and, and a lot of things that we still need to learn about uh, what problems are going to be amenable to quantum uh, speed up? Next slide, please. So, uh, quantum cryptography. Um, sorry, uh, the, the quantum threat to cryptography. Um, one of the first, um, one of the quantum applications, applications of a quantum computer that made a first, that first made a big splash, uh, in a sense, was called uh, Shor's algorithm, uh, owing to Peter Shor, and it solved a problem called uh, order finding or, or, or factoring. Uh, um, and that problem under, under, underlies the security of all of the uh, pu public key cryptography that's used around the world to uh, secure the internet for authentication. Um, basically, everything we do online is protected ultimately by some form of public key cryptography. Once we have these um, fully scalable fault tolerant quantum computers, uh, all of that is going to be vulnerable. Uh, and so the basic idea is with public key cryptography is that encrypting uh, information is easy and uh, anybody can encrypt information with a public key, but going the other way and decrypting is hard unless you have a secret uh, key, the, the private key. And so for classical computers, encrypting is easy. Next slide, please. Sorry, I hit the space bar for the slide and I muted. Um, <clears throat> so a large scale fault tolerant quantum computer, of course, running Shor's algorithm will make code breaking easy even without the secret key. And that's a huge problem. Next slide, please. So how do we solve that problem? Well, there are two basic approaches. One is to, to use those features of quantum mechanics. And I talked about quantum um, communications. Uh, so there's a technology called quantum, uh, quantum key distribution, QKD. And it allows you to do, um, it, it allows you to, to establish secret keys, uh, secret uh, encryption keys uh, in an alternative way to uh, public key cryptography using quantum technologies. And uh, QKD can offer an unprecedented level of security uh, that you can't get with any classical technology. And another approach is to replace the current suite of public key cryptography uh, algorithms that we have uh, with new ones 
that are built on math problems that we that aren't vulnerable to Shor's algorithm and that we believe will not be vulnerable to quantum computer attacks of the future. And so those are two very different approaches. Next slide, please. Quantum key distribution, um, of course, one of the challenges of QKD is that it's a physical layer technology, uh, meaning you have to have specialized hardware. Uh, and, um, you know, for example, you can't, I don't think you can do it over, um, over copper, so you can't do it over ethernet. You need optical fibers or uh, you can do it through free space. Uh, it's also distance limited. You can't, um, you have to have sort of trusted nodes every 150 kilometers or so, uh, or you can use a satellite. Um, uh, to overcome the distance limitation. But again, these are, these are significant uh, uh, deployment challenges. Next slide, please. Quantum resistant cryptography, of course, uh, is a software-based solution. Uh, you replace the existing suite of, uh, of crypto uh, algorithms in, your, you know, in all of your computers and all of your devices. Uh, and so it's, uh, it doesn't have the same deployment limitations and challenges. Um, it, you know, it works over IP networks, the same as uh, all of our existing crypto, uh, but it is vulnerable to what's called a record now and decrypt later attack, which means that, um, which means that potentially, um, sorry, my alarm is going off here, which means potentially um, if, if using, using public key cryptography, using um, quantum resistant cryptography is potentially vulnerable to um, to somebody recording the transmission and then decrypting it later. Uh, so it's vulnerable to unforeseen future advances in, um, in computation. Uh, but, there, but there is a NIST uh, standardization process underway and we will see uh, new suites of uh, quantum resistant cryptography solutions being deployed around the world uh, in the years ahead. Next slide, please. Um, I'll skip the slide because I am kind of out of time. Um, uh, this final thing I'll say is that quantum, compu quantum computing, quantum cryptography, uh, quantum communications, and quantum sensing are all being commercialized, uh, both in Germany and in Canada. Uh, and both countries have a, a robust and growing um, uh, commercial sector for quantum technologies. Uh, there are challenges, of course, one of which, not the least of which, is uh, a, 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 a tech talent shortage or a tech talent uh, lim limitation. Uh, we need more people, we need to train more people that understand these technologies that can develop uh, new quantum technologies. Uh, and um, of course, we have, you know, wonderful institutions in both countries that are, uh, that are working hard to fill that uh, gap. Certification programs need to be developed so that we can uh, certify uh, expertise. Uh, and companies, you know, we, we need to be able to assess companies um, so that we can pick winners. Uh, next slide, I think I'm at the end here. Great. Uh, yeah. So, of course, I'd be delighted to chat with anybody uh, at any time. And uh, thank you for, for listening. And uh, it's been a pleasure and is a pleasure to, uh, to join you today. Thanks so much, Phil. So if you're wondering how Phil became so smart and knowledgeable, you don't need to wait very long for an answer, because we will now be hearing from Phil's former PhD supervisor, Dr. Michele Mosca, a well-known international expert in the field. Professor Mosca is co-chair of Quantum Industry Canada and co-founder of the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo, a professor in the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization of the Faculty of Mathematics and a founding member of Waterloo's Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Michele. Thank you, Peter. Bonjour tout le monde. Guten Tag. Uh, ich freue mich heute zu Ihnen sprechen zu dürfen, uh, in particular about the quantum computing ecosystem. With a focus on quantum computing, I think we've already, we're already seeing that it's part of a broader quantum information technology ecosystem, but the focus today um, will center on quantum computing. And, you know, back in 1999, uh, there was certainly, there was about, there's a handful of people who'd done seminal work in quantum algorithms and complexity, inventing, you know, quantum key distribution, co-inventing it. Uh, among the inventors of quantum teleportation, pioneers in, in qubits, in optical systems, and so on. So it was a small number, but the field was small back then, and Canada was already you know, a powerhouse uh, around the world uh, in quantum computing. Fast forward you know, 22 years, and now we have over 100. We're in the hundreds in terms of professors in this area. We're, in, well in, we're into the thousands now in terms of students and postdocs working in this field. Uh, we're moving into the innovation space. There's incubators and so on. 
there's multi-sector, there's not just multidisciplinary research, and now there's multi-sector collaborations going on all across Canada, from the new Quantum Algorithms Institute out west to you know, Antic over in Quebec and, and so on. Um, and now, you know, the companies across Canada have come together into an association, and over a third of those companies are quantum computing related. I'll talk a bit about more of that more about that soon. Um, I want to echo something you know Phil Kay had mentioned. And it's relevant to quantum computing because in order to benefit from all the positive things quantum computing will bring, we must make sure it won't, you know, of course, decimate our digital platforms and undermine all the other valuable things we enjoy today. And Canada and Germany are really stand as global leaders, uh, true global leaders in this getting ready for a safe quantum future, safe quantum computing future. And there's a, here's a long list uh, borrowed from one of Bridget Walsh's, Walsh's presentations of the many government, industry, academic, academia collaborations to help prepare not just Canada, but the world. To, so we can just safely, we can in an un, unencumbered way, uh, enjoy the benefits of quantum computing. I mean, the alternative, it won't be, won't be good. So we don't want to go there. Uh, and Germany is also, you know, again, one of the true shining lights. And I use this in all my presentations, just my ones in, in Germany. I was actually honored to be you know, one of the keynote speakers at, at this event, launching a number of BMBF funded projects in post-quantum cryptography. Germany is also a leader in, in, in quantum key distribution. There's a number of initiatives. I can't possibly list, list them all. And on the academic side, we have long-standing collaborations uh, between Canada and Germany and the rest of the world. But I do think this is one of the several areas where Canada and Germany can really be together uh, you know, much stronger than the sum of its parts help create security and prosperity for our citizens, as well as the rest of the world. Now, transitioning back to, so let's assume, let's hope we work together to make it safe, to, to enjoy all the benefits of quantum computing. I can't possibly list everything that Canada is doing, all of our strengths. So I'll just give a couple of examples across the spectrum um, and broadband. Now we're a professor at the University of Ottawa. You know, one of the problems, looking ahead, you know, over a decade ago, and what, where is the future heading and what are the, what are the fundamental problems we need to address if we really want to reap the rewards of quantum computing? Well, one is, how do we do quantum computing in the cloud? When, how do we trust that we get the faithful answer from, the, from someone else's quantum computer? How do we assure that our information remains private, the part of the information that needs to remain confidential and so on? And she pioneered a very fundamental framework for allowing this sort of blind quantum computing. And... This, of course, is now becoming a commercially interesting uh, a bit, you know, technology and capability. In fact, she's an advisor to a startup that is working in this space. So this whole ecosystem is starting to, to come together and to gel. And there's an, an incubator in Toronto, for example, that helps the startup uh, startups get off the ground. Another example of great fundamental research being driven in Canada today is from uh, Professor Stephanie Simmons now at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. She's working on building quantum bits out of certain spin-based systems. You know, a wide range of a very you know, important work published in the world's top journals. She's also thinking about not just the fundamental research, but also how will it be applied? How can it be used, right? And she's written some thoughtful pieces about the commercialization landscape. And she's even the chief quantum officer at a company that spun out of her work. So this is sort of examples, and there's many, many others across Canada, not necessarily always the same person, but this, this pipeline from fundamental to applied, to innovation, to commercialization, to adoption, right? That, is, that has been evolving in Canada for decades now. And it's a very rich environment uh, we have. And it's recognized, our commercial ecosystem is, is, is recognized around the world. Um, again, over 30 companies now. This is already an outdated collection of logos. Um, but the quantum computing companies, which are a big part of our quantum industry, include companies looking at applications of quantum computing. Of course, D-Wave started this many years ago with their quantum annealing technologies. And now other companies uh, are, again, on the front lines of, of application areas. Others are either in addition to or alternatively looking at the quantum software tools that will bridge the applications to the hardware. Other companies are looking at you know, the, the software or the hardware itself for quantum computing. 
again, a, a vast, a quickly growing array of companies in this space. Also companies on the quantum safe side of the equation, again, to prepare for the safe quantum era. And we're, it's, it's a growing uh, supportive ecosystem. There's a broad recognition in Canada that this requires you know, all these different elements to work together coherently. And there's a national quantum strategy being launched. It's already been announced and underway. Uh, I already mentioned some of the elements we have going for us in Canada. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, just to be clear, but I want to highlight some examples like the Quantum Algorithms Institute, a new initiative bringing together the academic and industry activities, the incubators. There's many Canadian government programs to support this initiative. Uh, so again, this is just two examples, especially focused on quantum computing. There's this great Innovation Solutions Canada program which is starting and we expect it will accelerate its support of the adoption of these quantum technologies and, and quantum enabled technologies. And there's a new, just a brand new program uh, led out of NRC now called the Applied Quantum Computing Challenge. So as you can see, we have this, this full ecosystem, I mean, rapidly growing um, and we see many great synergies. Definitely historically there have been many and I see sort of a three great pillars where Canada and Germany can really work together to great, create greater prosperity and security for our own citizens and also uh, bring that you know, those opportunities to the rest of the world. In the quantum safe side, in, in sort of the, the, the research side of the equation, and also the commercialization side. Uh, and I really look forward to the rest of the talks today and to ongoing future collaborations uh, with our friends in Germany. Vielen Dank. Great. Many thanks uh, for the overview, McKelly, and also for your leadership uh, in quantum physics in Canada over the last couple of decades. Um, our next lecture on the German quantum computing ecosystem will be given by Tati uh, Dr. Tatiana Wilk. Dr. Wilk is the general manager of the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology, which is a cluster of excellence funded by the German Research Foundation. Before that, she worked for several years as a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics on single atom cavity quantum electrodynamics. Dr. Wilk enjoys working on forming a strong quantum community in Munich, on connecting academia and industry in Bavaria, on strengthening education in quantum engineering, and on engaging the public in quantum technology, which is, uh, is what she's here to do today. Thanks, Dr. Wilk. Thank you very much, um, Peter. It's a pleasure for me to be here and share with you um, uh, our the our thoughts about the German quantum ecosystem, quantum computing ecosystem. Um, just recently, the, the German quantum technology um, got a boost, for, a boost of funding uh, from, from the German federal government, which announced um, as, a, as part of the economic recovery plan after the Corona crisis uh, about funding of, of 2 billion euros actually for the development and production of quantum technologies in Germany. So um, they do not only want to, to fund research, but also the production of quantum technologies, which is uh, important. Um, the new industrial pillar um, based on quantum technology should cover hardware as well as software. And it is important that um, the excellent research that is going on already in Germany is transferred to product uh, development. Moreover, Germany wants to support the foundation of companies and startups, um, which, which is maybe more, which we could uh, take as an, an example from Canada. Actually, I really enjoyed, um, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, Michele's talk about um, the, the many uh, companies um, flourishing in, in the Canadian ecosystem. So um, to, do, to do the funding in the right way, to, to bring um, the, um, the funding into the right channels, the uh, German federal government um, asked 16 experts from academia and industry to give their advice on how to best invest into quantum technology. So they, um, they, um, what the, what they, they first analyzed um, the status quo of, of uh, quantum technology expertise um, in Germany and found that there is a very strong expertise in, in academia, um, but in, in and um, as well industry is very strong in basic and enabling technologies. 
but a comprehensive ecosystem is missing, which would um, support a, a whole um, supply chain of quantum technologies. Also, the level of IP in quantum technology that is um, found in, in Germany is, is quite low, and there are only a few startups. Um, moreover, I mean, we are we will soon miss uh, quantum smart uh, a quantum smart workforce uh, if we do not invest in in um, educating the next generation of uh, quantum engineers now. So their recommendation was to reinforce the research centers that are existing already in Germany and focus their activities in particularly on um, quantum computing and to strongly interconnect these activities with the German industry. Um, so responsible for implementing uh, this program are the, um, the Ministry of Education and Research, the BMBF, and as well as the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, the BMWI. They share um, the funds uh, almost equally, and the BMBF um, is is um, is calling or is calling for applications at the moment from um, from research centers and from um, new clusters uh, that are formed from academia and industry, with with, a, with now a very strong focus on quantum computing demonstrators and quantum computing applications. Um, they have actually um, also regarding the, the advice of the experts um, put in a very high technical requirements for these um, you know, for these projects that uh, which are uh, defined by the number of qubits that uh, will be uh, that will be addressed uh, the gate fidelities uh, as well as problems as scalability of quantum computing um, hardware and um, also the quantum advantage of quantum software and uh, soon there will be more calls on um, also on quantum metrology and sensing as well as communication um, for the BMWI, um, this looks a bit different. They put about 85% of their funds into the uh, German Aerospace Center, DLR, which acts actually as a project managing um, the office, <laughs> as well as the research institutions. So they will distribute about 80% of their funds into industry, so they will support industry in, in, um, in developing quantum hardware and quantum software, and they put 20% of the funds into their own research and new institutes that which are forming at the moment. Um, moreover, there are other um, projects uh, supported by BMWI, uh, such as a platform Planck, and a platform and ecosystem for quantum assisted artificial intelligence. Then there is the Quantum Technology Competence Center, which ser serves as an access point for quantum uh, technology expertise um, for, uh, for industry, uh, which, which for people who would like to, to apply uh, quantum technologies or to found a companies. Then there is also the National Space Program, which uh, looks for quantum technology applications for space. Actually, in Germany, there are many, traditionally, very many um, research centers uh, all over Germany. So this is a map from the source is the, the VDE Technologie Zentrum. Um, and there are many excellent research groups with various expertise. So we have experts in, um, in neutral atom quantum simulation, in uh, superconducting qubit quantum computing, in uh, Quantum computing based on um, based on uh, trapped ions um, and also on spin qubits or also on photonics. In in the European Union, almost every every fifth uh, quantum technology research group comes from Germany. So we have many national and international projects running already, and there are universities and research institutions that work together. The, um, we have clusters of excellence, such as uh, ourselves, the MCQSD, and other research centers. And there is also a grassroots initiative like the Quantum Alliance, 
which is actually an association um, of, um, of different clusters of excellence uh, and research centers throughout Germany. Um, and now I would like to point out our strategy in Munich, just as an example, since uh, other uh, centers are, have, are following a similar strategy. So in Munich, we have formed, um, there was an initiative that was formed um, by the two large universities in Munich, the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich and the Technical University of Munich. Um, founding member will be as well, the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Nürnberg, and uh, the Max Planck Society, the Fraunhofer Society, as well as the Bayerische Akademie der Wissenschaften. The idea of the Munich Quantum Valley is to, to follow a comprehensive quantum strategy. So they want to build actually quantum computers based on um, ion trap quantum computers and neutral atoms um, as well as superconducting qubits. And they will also launch flagship projects um, or lighthouse projects. Um, then there will be infrastructure that will be um, installed um, deep tech infrastructure, which will be open to universities, to startups and to, to companies, and which will be connected to the labs of Fraunhofer and the Max Planck Society. Moreover, in Munich, we are already um, building uh, qu the, the quantum smart workforce. Um, we have a master's course on quantum science and technology running. Um, just recently, a project launched that uh, is retraining uh, or will, will be retraining engineers um, uh, from industry, and we are doing outreach activities. Here you see a bit more detailed the consortia um, of, of the Munich uh, Quantum Valley. So we have a consortium covering superconducting qubits, uh, trapped atom quantum computing, so neutral atom as well as ion, ions. Then there is a, a theory. Um, we also have uh, software and integration. Um, we have a consortium um, looking for scalable hardware and system engineering. Uh, another consortium covering quantum, algorith quantum algorithms for applications and, and cloud and industry, and also hardware adapted theory. Moreover, as I already mentioned, there will be lighthouse projects covering other quantum technologies, um, and there is a uh, a plan for um, education in Bavaria, not only for students at universities and not only for the workforce, um, but also we, we would like to bring quantum technology already to schools. Um, moreover, there is another project uh, which covers the quantum technology park and entrepreneurship. So where we want to enforce the uh, um, startup landscape here in, in Bavaria or in Germany in general. Um, so we have been very lucky in Munich um, that uh, the Free State of Bavaria is supporting the Munich Quantum Valley and already announced that uh, support of about 300 million euros. Um, and in a recent visit, Angela Merkel um, was well, <laughs> told us that uh, the federal government will also contribute to the Munich Quantum Valley. So the calls are still running, so we don't know how much funding we will receive, but there will be more to come. But what I would like to point out that this was, of course, only an example. So there are other centers in, in um, Germany, such as the Quantum Valley Lower Saxony, which covers um, university in Hanover and the, the Technical University in Braunschweig and the um, PTB, the um, Physikalische Technische Bundesanstalt. There is also a center forming in, in and around Jülich, and of course the DLR centers in Ulm and Hamburg and many others. But we have a very strong quantum community in Germany with a very with regular exchanges um, on research topics as well as on strategies. So with this, I would like to summarize. Um, um, there is a very strong effort in Germany going on and uh, please stay tuned. Projects are starting soon and first results are expected in, in about five years. Thank you very much.
And many thanks to you, Dr. Wilk, uh, for this overview of the uh, German quantum computing uh, ecosystem. It's uh, it's quite a quite a fascinating topic. So much money being invested, and things happening quickly. Um, We'll move on now to our panel discussion where our panel of experts answer questions about quantum computing. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Julie Lefebvre of the National Research Council of Canada. Dr. Lefebvre joined the National Research Council as Director General of the Security and Disruptive Technologies Research Centre in 2019. Prior to joining the NRC, she worked for 20 years at Defence Research and Development Canada, where she was the driving force behind the Canadian Department of Defence Quantum Science and Technology Strategy. Dr. Lefebvre has a PhD in quantum physics from McMaster University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in quantum chaos theory at Washington State University. On top of this, I can say that my own passion for this science has benefited from more than 30 years of back and forth discussion and debate with Dr. Lefebvre, who has adeptly answered the endless questions I've had over the years. Dr. Lefebvre. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I can always count on you for a, a really fresh introduction. Um, so uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, as part of this conference and to, you know, to moderate this panel of experts. So what I'll do is I'll first start by introducing the panelists um, and we'll go through a, a several sets of questions and then we will leave five minutes uh, towards the end. It, 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 like the audience has any questions uh, to, to be able to ask to the panelists. So I'll start with the introductions. So who we have here, we have um, panelists from both Canada and Germany. We're starting with uh, Nicholas uh, Godbout. He is, uh, Professor Godbout is the head of the Department of Engineering Physics at Polytechnique Montréal. He is a former co-president and is a co-founder of Castor Optics and a spin-off of Polytechnique Montréal and commercializing optical fiber couplers for biomedical applications. And since 2019, he is also the director of the Institut Transdisciplinaire d'Information Quantique Intrigue. So thank you for joining us. Um, as well, we have uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, sorry, Andrew Fersman. He's a co-founder of OneQubit and serves as its chief executive officer. He was a founding uh, partner of a Vancouver-based VCC firm, Minor Capital, co-founder of uh, Satellogic Nano Satellites, and co-founder of CloudTel Communications. Dr. Uh, Fersman studied economics at the University of Waterloo and philosophy and political sciences at the University of British Columbia prior to postgraduate programs in technology studies at Singularity University and financial engineering at Stanford University. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we also have Professor Moonfrit Hauswitz. Um, he has been the executive director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Open Communication um, since 2014 and holds the chair of Open Distributed Systems at the Technical University in Berlin. He is active in many scientific and political committees around digitization and as the director of the Weizenbaum Institute for the Network Society and principal investigator of the Einstein Center Digital Future, the Berlin Big Data Center and the Helmholtz Einstein International Berlin Research School in Data Science. Thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Nicholas Hegeman. He is the managing director of Just, uh, Just Quantum, sorry for that, and responsible for business development. Before that, he worked as a management consultant in different business and technical areas, focusing on software integration and financial services. He was responsible for several big projects, mostly in the field of trading and risk management. Uh, Nicholas worked at the German, uh, German electron cyclotron DESI, and he received his degree uh, in physics with subsidiary subject in economics uh, from the University of Hamburg. Thank you for joining us. And so I will uh, turn our attention to the actual questions. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll start with the first question and, um, and go through our, our, our panelists. So um, starting with uh, why should Canada and Germany have a quantum computer? 
So, uh, Moonfred, maybe you could start with uh, uh, with giving us your perspective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Bonjour, au Canada from Germany. This is as much as uh, I will, will bother you with my French. Now, I think in in many areas, uh, quantum computers will be necessary for scientific breakthroughs. Now, why should you have a national quantum computer? I mean, it's very simple. You want to, you want to have uh, the economic benefits that come out of uh, years and decades and, uh, of investments in your, in your home country. We've seen this in many places that there has been a lot of very interesting and good fundamental research and the economic benefits then move to uh, other countries. I mean, I just take computer science, the platform economy and a lot of other things that for example, were developed in Europe and in other places um, uh, when it comes to uh, distributed network systems all along the World Wide Web and who reaps in the benefits. So big companies in the Silicon Valley, no, there's nothing wrong with having a good sense of business, but I think we should have learned our lesson by now. We do a lot, and as we've seen in the previous presentations, a lot of extremely uh, good and groundbreaking research in Canada and in the EU. And I think it's necessary to secure the benefits in our economies and then export it to the US, for example. Thank you very much, Andrew. <laughs> Hello, yeah, and I, I'll just say, I know I'm around so many erudite people here. Sadly, I am not a doctor, so I'll just be addressed as regular Andrew through this, but oh. uh, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I, I would say that one of the things that's really interesting uh, about quantum computing is that we don't yet know exactly what they're for in the same sense that you could imagine as people were toiling away to build the first vacuum tubes, they probably weren't imagining Farmville being played on Facebook, you know, deep into the future. And so we suffer from not knowing the potential applications for these devices yet while also having some very clear understanding of areas where these devices will make a big difference. And one of the best um, reasons that I can think, especially for Germany, to be involved in quantum computing is that quantum computing is really about simulating the emergence of the physical world, really the emergence of things as low level as chemistry from the world of physics. And if you can think back to all of the amazing material science and chemistry history and industry that exists within Germany, the material science and raw materials um, capabilities of Canada, these are two nations that should really benefit from having a much deeper understanding of how to command the fundamental forces of nature to recreate our physical spaces. And that understanding and knowledge is really going to be very difficult without quantum computation. So this is one of the very specific answers I think we can give to this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's turn to a different question. Uh, how do quantum computing, quantum communications and quantum sensing relate to each other? Um, and to start uh, answering that question, uh, Nicholas. Yes, thank you. Uh, so first, uh, from the perspective of Intrix, so this, we are this uh, transdisciplinary institute in quantum information. Uh, bringing together engineers, physicists, and uh, computer scientists. So all these subjects, I think, really benefit from the interplay. Uh, it, it, it's a complex subject. Quantum information is a complex subject. And I think that we gain a lot by uh, uh, bridging uh, uh, different communities together. Now, my perspective as an engineer, um, what what have uh, you know these computers, communication, and sensors have in common? Uh, going into the future, it's quite clear that we will need an underlying quantum technology, an economy of quantum technology that will support um, uh, that will support all these subjects. And and to come back to an, an analogy that Andrew uh, was give, you know mentioning earlier, we didn't quite know in the past what vacuum tubes and then transistors were four. 
but they are useful for all kinds of different things. It's going to be true in quantum technologies is that there will be common technologies underlying computation and the other uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Nicholas, do you have anything to add? No, actually, I think uh, Nicolas touched all, all points here. I mean, we as a company are involved more in the quantum computation field, so nothing much to add to relate the, the three topics to each other. Okay, thank you very much. Um, going to another question, how can industry get involved in quantum computing? And for that, I will turn to Nicholas, you, you again. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean that's a that's a very relevant point uh, for, for 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 us and I think for the industry. I mean it's a it's a push and pull game between research and academia, and to 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 know the relevant things to 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 research about going forward into into industry applications. It's very relevant that people sit together from different. Uh, with different experience, with different backgrounds. So we see it currently in a research project, uh, Enaquant, where we um, yeah, research, do research about quantum algorithms in energy markets. And um, yeah, going back and forth with um, people from university building uh, quantum computers and thinking about what are the current borders of uh, classical computation is is always a challenge to um yeah to to speak that the, the same language of what is needed in the industry what is the real problem what is the complexity of the problem and where quantum computers might benefit so um yeah how can industries get in get involved uh, three questions maybe to 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 ask yourself as an industry leader um first does your business model rely on technology do you run complex optimization, simulation, machine learning tasks on a regular basis? And three, are you ready to invest in research and development? Because the technology of quantum computation might not bring the business um, benefit in the next 12 months, but is rather a long-term race. Well, those are very good points. Thank you for that. Uh, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, it, it's also really interesting to notice what's happening in the uh, the world of industry today. Um, there was a comment earlier about the tendency for Silicon Valley to grab technologies and run with it. Um, this is already happening. There is now five companies um, on the quantum hardware side based out of the United States with larger than a billion dollar valuation. There are now two computing companies uh, in the hardware space that are currently at higher than a $3 billion valuation. And a number of these companies have more cash on their balance sheets than the combined um, Munich Canadian National Quantum Strategy um, budgets put together. So we're starting to see small startup companies that command more resources than entire national strategies. Um, and so the uh, ability to link together these efforts to be able to see these as all different pieces of the puzzle instead of competing against one another and to understand where are there unique gaps that are available to be filled by industry? Where are there unique gaps that can only be filled by government or research institutions? And then thinking about a strategy that empowers all of these different actors to fulfill their missions best. I think this is really the place that we're standing today. And the success of our industry will really be about coordinating all of those components together. Oh, that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to another question is, uh, how does data privacy impact uses and applications of quantum computing? And for that, uh, Moonfred, do you, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, Judy. I think, especially for industry, this is of paramount importance because uh, the areas that, for example, optimization and simulation algorithms will run in uh, are at the core of the economic models for a lot of technology companies. So it's really important that the information is kept in secret. If you transport information into a cloud, I mean, you cannot store, at least at the moment, information on a quantum computer, but it has to sit very close to the quantum computer and it is an enormous amount of, of information that, that uh, has to be transported there. Now, to be 
uh, safe and secure in terms of these trade secrets, data privacy, of course, is of paramount importance. If you then, uh, well, with, uh, if you then also uh, process information, for example, in a, in a different use case, let's say if you go into traffic management, that potentially can be traced back to individual. That's the same. That's the same issue. The data privacy and the security of the data has to be has to be protected. And how this is done in practice, we have shown, or how this could be done as one example in practice, we have shown with the setup of the uh, IBM Quantum System Q here in Germany, which is a completely under uh, European data protection laws under German uh, legislation. And we guarantee that no information gets out of, out of the system. Now, as soon as there is quantum storage, I mean, I'm, I'm really not qualified to talk about quantum storage uh, with, my, with my background, maybe some of the colleagues here in the discussion, then the, the game may change, change again. And in terms of quantum communication, of course, we have heard already that uh, the security protocols need, need to up their game to continue to be safe in the future. On the other hand, there are also some really great uh, opportunities there. So quantum communication, as soon as somebody is tapping your quantum communication, you'll know. Or a quantum key distribution may also help to increase existing networks to, in, to new security levels. So it's, it's, a, it's a game of, of threat versus, versus benefit. And I think we are well advised to know as much as possible what is possible, uh, what can be done technically in this domain. Absolutely. Um, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, that's an, that's, a, that's an excellent answer. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going towards a cloud model of quantum computing. I don't think that users will own their own com quantum computer. So uh, it comes back to the first question that you had why do we need quantum computers in Canada and Germany? It touches this point of, of, of data sovereignty, uh, this point that we're, we're, we're trying to see in both countries, uh, as I just learned uh, from, from the German side, these requirements, legal requirements to, to store sensitive data uh, and, and public data within the country. And so uh, going forward, uh, this will most likely transfer in the quantum computing realm and um, uh, Philip came and I think covered pretty much the subject of the threat versus uh, defenses to the security of quantum communications. Um, and again, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, Andrew's comment that now we're seeing more funding in the private sector than in the public sector. And we're seeing now the effects on um, the social effects of having, uh, uh, you know, on the regular internet, on the classical internet, the effect of very large corporations. Uh, and I think that's another reason for governments and funding agencies to be involved and to keep going the future, some control over uh, where the field is going in, in terms of privacy and the impact on society. Yeah, those are very uh, good points. Thank you. Um, what I think I'll do is uh, we, we have a little extra time, but this is great because uh, we can turn perhaps right away to some of the questions that have been coming in to the questions and answer uh, chat and, um, and sort of take it from there. So why don't I take the first one? Because this one this is an important one, is that there seems to be a talent uh, shortage in quantum. And what would you recommend is the best way for someone to get into the field? And, and in particular, what are the types of barriers that a student could face? Um, would anybody like to take uh, that question? Okay, Nicholas. Yeah, I'll jump first. And um, when, when we, we talk about talent shortage, uh, well, I think most of us that have, have grown from academia, like university level, um, we'll soon reach a point where we'll need a technical workforce underneath. And I think it's uh, it, it's really time right now uh, when we talk about talent in quantum information uh, to, to, to train also at the, at the technical levels uh, for, for uh, uh, all the support. We'll need quantum programmers. We'll need uh, uh, people do maintenance of, of, of quantum computers or quantum communication systems. So that's one aspect. Um, uh, for a talent that is very important. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Manfred. Well, I think specifically the, the mix of expertise that you need in some of the domains that uh, Nicolas has mentioned is, is really, in, uh, really important. You know, uh, you can uh, study quantum physics, you can study quantum informatics, you can become an engineer, you can become a computer scientist, but essentially quantum, uh, quantum computers are at the crossroads, uh, at the borders of all, of all these areas. And what we need to do in the in the uh, university system that we also come uh, have to come up with curricula that touch the essential points so that you have sufficiently deep knowledge in in the various areas and that you that we equip the uh, students with the necessary tools that they can actually solve the problems that practical quantum computing in industry in, uh, is going to uh, is going to uh, they are going to face in, in these areas. And this is really tricky because also the different science disciplines need to start to talk or start more to talk with each other. You know, uh, everybody tries to frame the problem in their own discipline, but this is clearly insufficient in there. And I think it's also important that uh, um, the governments invest into universities and studies pro study programs in this area so that we can educate these experts. There is already a, short a shortage of experts. If I, if I try to find people here in Berlin, um, there are a lot, a lot of companies that can pay uh, more than I can as a research uh, center, and they lo they love to go to the cool places. And we need to ensure that the places we are, Canada, Germany, the different cities, are the cool places where people come. We educate our own, and also from uh, foreign countries, the the good people come to this place. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, I would just note that Canada really suffers in some ways from an embarrassment of riches on this topic. We have these incredible clusters around the University of British Columbia, the University of Waterloo and the University of Sherbrooke, especially. But what we have uh, and what we anticipate is a shortage of the future. And so what we're really trying to do is to find ways to be able to bring in as many young people um, from this process and to be able to expose them, not just to the theoretical component, but to the sort of technical business components that are necessary in order to be a sort of well-rounded future entrepreneur, employee, researcher in this space, and to be able to take advantage of this early crop of activity uh, in order to be able to use utilize this to spread those capabilities through an even wider group of people and to really start a flywheel together. So the big part that I look at is how are we going to be able to reach as many people with this embryonic ecosystem that we have today to form the foundation for an even larger and healthier ecosystem in the future? Uh, that's a very good point. In fact, it goes uh, really, oh, uh, Nicholas, did you have anything to add? Sorry, before I turn to another question. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Did you say Nicolas or Nicholas? Oh, sorry, Nicholas. Sometimes difficult. I'll say Nicholas and Nicholas. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Well, maybe a pragmatic answer to your to your question. If you if you are if you are not coming from the field of quantum mechanics, it's really difficult to understand the foundations. But I experience that um, some people um, 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 having experience in software engineering and, and building classical algorithms is turning to a specific problem and think about what can benefit can quantum computing bring and look at some fundamental ideas of quantum computation. I mean, there are tutorials about how to solve, for example, Monte Carlo simulations. Um, with a quantum algorithm and start with a specific problem and yeah try to get through because if you did not study 30 years of quantum information science, it's really hard to come up with new things. Yeah, understood. Thank you for that. Um, in fact, this uh, your answers actually feed quite nicely into the next question that came in. And the question was, uh, could you share what goes into building a good quantum computing ecosystem? I don't know if anybody would like to take that question. I, I, I will have a go at it. That's a, that's a deep question. Um, it's an exercise that we've seen uh, a, a lot of effort going into uh, in the province of Quebec, especially during the last two years. What do we need to build an ecosystem? Uh, we need a little bit of everything. 
uh, we need the, the we need the, the solid state scientists who also understand quantum mechanics to work on the basic materials. How do you build a qubit, this quantum bit that is very difficult? And then engineers to to make this work and for all the, the layers on top, the electronics that we need for the control and, and computer scientists uh, who usually don't know anything about the hardware, uh, who, who, who tell us what how, how they should be built, how they should be connected, how do we increase protection. Um, and, and in order to, to realize uh, all that, uh, it necessitates a lot of uh, uh, classical electronics. So we need, as I mentioned before, uh, technical staff, technical staff and engineers to, to design all the Needed to solve all the nitty gritty details and the problems that come up in assembling a, a quantum computer. And then we also need to talk about the users. So we've also seen locally big efforts to educate potential users and banks, governments, uh, what will these be useful for, uh, give examples of algorithms, uh, work with uh, uh, institutes um, uh, who, who special, specialize more in the optimization problems. So yes, to build an ecosystem, it takes a little bit of everything and a lot of dialogue between mm -hmm. all these players. Absolutely. Ah, uh, Munfred. Well, uh... You know, th this is the this is the the one hundred thousand uh, dollar question: uh, build, how to build an ecosystem? Because this means that you have uh, a lot of scientific success, uh, scientific and, and economic success at your hands. Maybe only a small addition to what Nicola said: it's also that you have to uh, you have to uh, come up with a bit of a coolness factor. Mm -hmm. As as strange as this may sound, I mean, why do people go into the into into silicon valley or so because it's cool to be in silicon valley why they, do they go to ivy league universities all over the world because it's cool mm -hmm. so th i think the first thing is to attract people then they will see this is not a simple problem and it's hard and they need to learn a lot uh, specifically from different areas also as niklas had said if you are not involved evolved for 30 years in, in quantum mechanics, it's going to be difficult. But on the other hand, you know, um, there, there, is this, there is this nice quote by the former president of the Weizmann Institute. So uh, understand uh, no amount of, of research on candlelight would have brought across electricity. So that's the fundamental, that's the hardware, that's the, that's the tough stuff. But understanding the principle of combustion doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, mean you can build a Daimler. So he mentioned that one uh, car brand, so I'm not uh, doing uh, advertisement here. And this is exactly what we need here. We, under we need to understand the, the, the really the basic, very basic research, the basic principles. But on the other hand, there's a lot of engineering. And there's also a lot of engineering, not only in hardware, but also in software to make such a system successful. And a lot of, a lot of systems, for example, that come from computer science weren't even the best possible technical systems, but they were the usable systems. Think of the World Wide Web. When Tim Berners-Lee came up with originality, by the way, a physicist by training, so kudos to the physicists. Uh, it was really not up to the then existing technologies in distributed system, but it was there, people could use it and people could extend it. And uh, something incredible developed out of it, and some of the of the largest companies in the world that we that we have now. And this is something I think you will need for a successful ecosystem, so that these great ideas also flourish economically and scientifically. Well, that's a great answer. Uh, I think we have time for one more answer, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'll maybe just finish it off with a little bit of tough love for us here on this one, which is to say, you know, I love the back padding. I love all the congratulatory spirit for the things that we've done well. But I'd also note that I think we have something like three or four quantum valleys represented on this call. Um, I think of that as sort of an aspirational title. And what's likely to happen is the thing that made Silicon Valley successful is not the fact that they called themselves Silicon Valley. It's the fact that they really took risks that, you know, governments were available in order to help, uh, you know, 
create demand for some of these infant technologies along the way. And they did all the things that we're talking about, you know, real deep funding, risk taking, collaborations and procurement. Um, the things that we need to emulate about Silicon Valley aren't the way that they've described themselves as blank valley. It's the actual activities of creating some of these anchor points, using the success in order to create these foci, foci <laughs> that will uh, bring talent around them and being able to really nurture that going forward. So as we're all looking to have the kind of success that's causing us to name our activities around a particular place, let's really think about what made that place successful and whether we're doing those activities. Oh, that's a really good point there too. And uh, thank you very much uh, for all of your answer. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, Peter, I'm sure. going to, oh, uh, Peter, I'm going to uh, hand the baton back to you. Okay, just now that my video has been halted, so I'll have to wait for the host to start it. There we go. Now, I'm having some troubles with that. Can you see me, Julie? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> so thank you uh, very much, Julie, for, for running that panel. And thank you so much to all the panelists on it for the insightful discussion on this fascinating topic. Uh, it's a real treat to have so many great minds together at one time to answer questions. And it looks like I can see some of the questions in the chat. We probably could have gone on for another couple of hours. Um, so for some closing remarks, um, I'm going to turn you over to uh, Dr. Jewel Martin, who is the Chief Digital Research Officer at the National Research Council of Canada's Emerging Technologies Division. Dr. Martin has been a researcher and served in multiple leadership roles in the Digital Technologies Research Centre at the NRC. His strategic leadership has resulted in an increase in the impact of digital technology research at the NRC and beyond. In addition, Dr. Martin has established research and development programs drawing interest and collaboration from universities and other government departments. Joel. Good day, thank you, and good to talk. As emphasized by uh, His Excellency Stefan Dion at the very beginning, we are here, we're all here, to strengthen the partnership uh, in the development of quantum technologies. For Ma I can't make it the whole list that Stefan Dion listed, but manufacturing, transportation, defense, uh, and many other fields. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize three simple conclusions that I drew from, from the, everything that we've heard today. Uh, and I'll try to do it very quickly. Uh, as Andrew Firstman, oh, so the first conclusion is that we are at a turning point. Uh, as Andrew Firstman noted uh, early, early on in the panel, we don't know quite yet what quantum technologies are good for, but we know, or we have faith that they're going to lead to scientific breakthroughs. And we, in both countries, want to reap the benefits. And we're looking at this now. Well, one of the reasons we're looking at this now is because the quantum computers that are available now are powerful enough to exceed what can be simulated on classical computers in a couple of cases, and we expect that to increase. And, and we expect to see practical advantages, commercially uh, uh, exploitable advantages. And all of this has led to additional funding from government, and we've heard from venture capitalists, maybe more than government. So a second conclusion is that Canada and Germany are seizing the opportunities and both countries want to do more. So we've heard that in Canada, there's this national quantum strategy with, with the new funding, it's adding up to more than a billion. In Germany, we, we heard about the investment of 2 billion. Uh, and we're, we heard ab about a lot of the successes. Uh, so students and professors and projects. Uh, and in both countries, there is a, a robust startup environment, as you saw in, in Michele Moskis' presentation there, are around 20 startup companies in Canada. These are all things that we can celebrate. And that leads me to my, the third conclusion is that our opportunity is collaboration. We want to create a vibrant, effective ecosystem and we can all be proud of these successes, but there are gaps and we have the opportunity to learn from each other about those gaps. The map that Tatiana Vilk, uh, Dr. Velk put up and uh, the map that Dr. Mosca put up and the opportunities uh, all across Canada and all across Germany. So thank you. Uh, uh, I really uh, loved the session today and uh, danke schön.
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for your closing remarks. And well, uh, let me turn my video on again. There we go. Um, I hope you found the event uh, interesting and educational. Uh, quantum computing and quantum technologies in general have tremendous potential to transform and improve our lives. And it's going to be fascinating to watch as these technologies roll out over the years. I'd like to note that the Embassy of Canada in Berlin, uh, in collaboration with the National Research Council, is putting on a quantum, a Canadian quantum technology R&D partnering mission to Germany in February of next year. This mission will establish industrial R&D collaborations between Canadian and German organizations with the hopes of future commercialization. I'd be happy to put you in touch with the embassy in Berlin for more information if you wish. Uh, in closing, I'd like to say it's been an honor and a pleasure to be your MC today. I'd like to thank the National Research Council staff in Munich and members of the Embassy of Canada in Berlin for helping to put on this event. In particular, my sincere thanks to our organizing team of Petra Kovakova, uh, Jack Pokopek, Olivier Waugh, Jordan Kahn, and Jennifer Decker for all their hard work and dedication in making this event a success. Thank you for your time and attention, everyone. Have a good day. Bonne journée. Grazie. Uh, Daniel Val, Terima Casibania, and Dankeschön.